the low maturities are, are going to cause uh, you know, a lot of problems for a, a lot of lenders and borrowers. Um, but once again, it's going to be a little bit more of a slow roll. Uh, these loans may have 18 months left. They may have two, two years left, three years, maybe six months, three months. So, I mean, those are the ones that we're kind of seeing today in that regard. Um, where do I think this plays out? I, I think I've been wrong. I think so many people have been wrong. Um, really, when COVID hit, you know, the great black swan event, mm. everyone thought there'd be a flood of distressed assets into the marketplace. And um, due to some government intervention, that wasn't quite the case. That may be coming home to roost now mm. in, in that regard. I don't know that there's necessarily uh, the stomach within the federal government um, in, in either executive branch to, or excuse me, either branch to um, roll out more aid, for lack of a better word. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's gonna play out somewhat slower. I do think by the end of the year, from speaking with some of the lenders we do work with, whether it's valuation work, disposition work, or receivership work for, uh, I was just with one a few weeks ago. Um, and, and he said by the end of the year, and we're doing some valuation work for them right now on a couple of distressed assets, but by the end of the year, he expects to have a couple of different situations to talk about with us. And he thinks by the middle of next year, um, as a special assets officer, he's gonna be quite busy. Hi there, Adam Gower here, founder of Gower Crowd and host of the Real Estate Reality Show on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Gower Crowd. My guest today is Mitch Vanneman, who is a receiver. He is vice president at Hilco, and his job, as you will discover, is to sit between lenders and borrowers to manage assets that are in distress. His insights are very interesting. Uh, he has deep experience in this field, having gone through the global financial crisis an awfully long time ago, so <laughs> 2007. Uh, 2008 and in the in the few years after that and he shares some of his insights then and how things are different today and how things are the same you are going to find his insights very interesting he is seeing what's going on and also gives some insights into where he thinks the market is headed over the next 12 months to find out more about mitch and hilco go to the podcast page at gowercrowd.com. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. It's totally free. It goes out every Wednesday. And we cover the world of commercial real estate with a particular focus on capital formation, how to raise money for your projects, but also with a focus today uh, or these days on uh, distressed real estate with a bias towards educating passive investors in what to look for, how to invest, and uh, what to be careful about in these uh, tough times. That's all there at GowerCrowd.com. Sign up, uh, subscribe to the newsletter, then you'll get all that information. All right, let's turn it over to Mitch Vanneman, Vice President at Hilco Real Estate. And let's learn what does what is a receiver and what do they do? Here he is. Mitch, thanks so much for joining me. I saw this article in BizNow. Uh, there was a fairly detailed article about receiverships and what's going on at the moment. So let's start at the very top. As a world expert in this field, what is a receiver? Well, Adam, thanks for having me on. And I think you're probably being generous with the expert description. Um, so essentially, the receiver is a neutral third party whose fiduciary responsibility is to a property um, that secures, in most instances, it's securing a loan. Um, and so normally how the process works is that you may have a property that's in default or the borrower is no longer capable of um, maintaining the property from life safety issues. So the, the lenders will petition the court uh, to put a neutral third party such as a receiver into place to safeguard the property, collect the rents, uh, pay, pay bills, um, and, and really safeguard the property until resolution can be found. Uh, and uh, so you're generally brought in by re uh, by uh, uh, lenders, are you? Is that is that how it works? Generally speaking, it, it is um, from the lending side is who petitions the court, and the borrower may very well be a well of, 
aware of this. We've seen a number of consensual receiverships this real estate cycle, as opposed to the last, where I feel that they were more contentious. Um, and in this instance, particularly with office, we're seeing more owners maybe tired of writing checks and where they feel good money or bad good money is going after bad money. They'd be maybe more willing to, to give the asset back to the lender. Yeah, so a consensual. So and under what circumstances, but like describe a consensual receivership. What's that? Is that where the lender says, we think there's problems, but we don't want to deal with you anymore. <laughs> so uh, we're going to bring a third party. How does that work? Yeah, to, really to simplify it, that's exactly it. Um, the, the loan may be in default or is in default. Uh, the, the borrower and the lender are too far off regarding negotiations for how to bring the loan current or, or what the properties may need in regards to renovations. Um, and so the, the lender may use as a negotiation tool that they may put a third party in um, to oversee the property. And, and that's where the receiver comes into play. But really, truly, um, the, the ones, a handful of what I've seen so far through this cycle, the borrower is made aware of that and agrees to it. Uh, and so when the initial court hearing takes place where the, the, uh, for the receivership, um, generally speaking, the borrower's counsel will be at that court hearing and will say that, that it is consensual and that they agree to proceed with their appointment of a receiver. And is it always through the courts, uh, Mitch, that a receiver is appointed? Can it be appointed outside of the courts? Yes, yeah, so that's been my experience in the past. It's always been through the court system. Uh, my work, I, I have not done federal receiverships, but my work has been uh, primarily through the state courts. Um, and, and that's where my authority comes from that court. And why do you think this time is different? We do love that idea that there's more consensual receiverships than during the uh, global financial crisis. What's fundamentally different uh, now than was then? I think particularly with office and offices, generally what I'm speaking to here, um, that's where we're seeing the majority of our uh, requests for receivership proposals and where our work has been. Um, generally with office, there's been such a large decline, particularly since uh, COVID initially struck. Um, there's been such a large decline in value that you have very large borrowers um, and, and smaller borrowers as well that you have kind of across the spectrum saying, we're not in a position or we choose not to feed this property any longer and we're willing to give the keys back because at no point do we think in the near term, 5, 10, 15 years, are we going to recoup our equity investment in this property? So why doesn't the bank handle that? If you've got a, a borrower who is willing to handle to, to hand the keys back, why doesn't the bank take over? Why, why do they need a receiver? Well, uh, for, for one, if it's going to go through the foreclosure process. Uh, they, they need a third party in there to oversee the property management mm -hmm. and provide property management services if, if that's part of the receivership's receiver's capabilities. Um, so the receiver basically or essentially oversees the management, the day-to-day -day operations of the property on behalf of both interested parties, the borrower and the lender until a foreclosure takes place and the title's transferred to the lender. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, during the uh, global financial crisis, I was actually brought into a bank being a kind of having real estate background, not banking background. To help them uh, divest of their non-performing real estate collateralized non-performing loan portfolio. And I remember one time uh, we had a hotel uh, that uh, went into foreclosure and there was a weekend when the bank actually owned this hotel and I was responsible for changing sheets and <laughs> putting muffins out and coffees, not literally, but I suddenly realized this isn't so easy, actually, when you take ownership. So what are the biggest challenges that you face and uh, that you see in your work? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's very key uh, for a receiver to have a good partner and a property management group. Uh, whether that's the existing property management group that may not be or is not affiliated with the borrower or bringing in a third party. Um, and over the course of my career from the great financial crisis uh, up until this point, we've been fortunate to work with a great third party management companies um, that you're, you're essentially, they're your coworkers. So you work with them on a daily basis. So you know exactly how they, how they handle their affairs and they're very familiar with how you handle your affairs. So Can that property... Sorry, guys, I shouldn't have interrupted you. 
not, not a problem, but property management, I would say is, is uh, probably the most important piece. And then as well as if uh, the, both parties, the borrower and the lender during the receivership are willing to lease up the property. Um, I think particularly with office, we're, we're seeing a lot of lenders that are wishing to lease up the property. They don't wanna just let it sit dormant. Um, so maybe these are smaller leases at lower rates than what they were three or four years ago, but they don't want the property to sit stagnant. And so part of our mandate as well as a receiver is to hire the most competent leasing company uh, within that particular geographic region or city. And what kind of approval processes do you have to go through when you're signing leases or making any kind of major decisions on a property? So it all depends on the court order. Um, and, and each court order is different. Some receiver, some situations, the receiver will have the capability up into a certain amount of square feet and dollars to approve those leases and, and sign the leases. Uh, in other instances, it may require a, approval from both the lender and the borrower. Mm. And in some instances, it may just require the approval of the lender should the borrower say, we no longer uh, need to have a say in the leasing of this property. And it may just require the approval of the lender. And some of the reasons that these processes are in place is that uh, uh, you know, often, particularly with office, what I'm seeing this time, the property doesn't have enough cash flow to sustain tenant improvements and leasing commissions. Mm. So someone needs to pay for those. And more likely than not, and really in the majority of the instances, that will be the lender that's going to pre-fund those. Right. And that just adds to the uh, unpaid principal balance and various other interests, et cetera. So to what extent do you end up selling assets like what, what proportion like how much do you actually to, to, to what extent are you able to resolve problems versus um patch a gap uh, before divesting of the asset right so th that's an interesting um question through the last cycle most of what we were involved in as a receiver a lot of times i would stay on and oversee the sales process once the property was foreclosed on and went, went to an REO portfolio mm. um but we would hire uh, neutral third party brokers to do that sale. You know, what we're hearing with the spike in interest rates um, that took place about a year ago, maybe 13 months ago, I think it was beginning of June when rates spiked. There's a, there's a lot of loans out there that are distressed or assets that are distressed, I should say. And they have well below what today would be or what is market interest rates as of today. So we're seeing more lenders willing for the right particular buyer asking the receiver to sell the asset along with the assumable debt to make the, the property more attractive to potential buyers. Interesting. So uh, typically you will see lenders selling uh, assets with the debt, will you, as a receiver? Or are they, do they want refinancing? I'm like, how, do, how does that work typically? Yeah, so I want to use the word typically, but it's taking, it's taking place in a handful of incidents uh, that we've seen where, particularly with office, again, I hate continue to go back to office <laughs> so i'll get you off that topic in a minute don't worry we'll get we'll get to the other asset classes but go on uh yeah so but uh, um really where maybe the uh, the market or excuse me the the contract interest rate and say there's 10 years remaining on the loan i'm just making this up yeah. is uh four percent for a cbd office building today that rate for a cbd office building if you can even get financing is most likely going to be north of 7% and probably to push easily into the teens. Right. And, and then, but will lenders extend loans to new buyers or provide facilitating loans? Or what do you say? I have seen that. Um, oh, I, I've seen a couple of transactions uh, that were, that I was not involved in, um, that Hilco was not involved in, but in particular markets where we're active as a receiver, I, I've seen um, transactions on office buildings where the lender has agreed to carry back debt on a property that that, that they um, have taken back as REO. Right. We we used to call these when I was at uh, at the bank during the GFC uh, facilitating loans. This is a special type of uh, loan the banks are permitted to do to deal with uh, non-performing assets. What is a facilitating loan? Yeah, it's it's really what the name says. It just helps facilitate the sale and move the property off the bank's books. As you know better than I do, banks are not equipped to manage properties or own properties. That's not what they do. They want to lend money and collect interest. Mm -hmm. um, and so the last thing they want to do, I did a lot of work during the, the last recession for mid-sized banks, um, particularly in the Midwest and the Western half of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And we would see them carry back 
debt um, or, or facilitate a, a loan to a new buyer, particularly with lots, um, where you have residential lots and a development and there are 40 homes built out and the lender was sitting on 300 lots that they foreclosed on. Um, to, to find a buyer for that uh, was a difficult task at that time when in certain markets you would hear, and you probably know this from your time at uh, your former employer, um, there's a lifetime supply of lots is what people thought <laughs> during the housing crisis. Right. Well, you know, the facilitating loans that we used to give were the, the to qualify for a facilitating loan, you needed a pen to sign the contract and a, and a down payment. That was basically it, right? Because the, from the bank's perspective, you know, they're taking an asset off the books that's non-performing, putting one on the books that is performing and reducing exposure by that 20%. Uh, and uh, I think it becomes a, an FCC foreclosure as well. So if somebody, actually, this was on notes. So if uh, if somebody fails to pay, there's no foreclosure. It's just, it's a 10-day process. They get the asset back and uh, and and then can sell it again. But they're 20% of, 20% uh, ahead of the game. So what about note sales? Just shifting to that. You've talked about REOs, but what about note sales? Do you work in, with those as well, with banks? Yeah, uh, we have a team of folks at Hillco Real Estate that specialize in note sales. It's it's somewhat sequestered off to the side of me. Should I need to involve them in any part of a receivership process, I would. But there really is, for all intents and purposes, a Chinese wall between us, uh, since I often act as a fiduciary. Um, what I've seen at, at, at this point is there have been a handful, I would say, of loan sales, particularly from some of the larger institutions, uh, balance sheet lenders, names that you would well know. And I, mm. From what I understand, it's more about balancing their portfolios uh, where they may have a little bit too much exposure in, in multifamily, and, um, and I'm making that up, but in multifamily, and they may wish to sell off some multifamily loans. Um, and it's more about balancing their risk. It's a risk management perspective. From a distress standpoint, we've seen one or two, not one or two, a dozen, a half a dozen, uh, distressed loans that, that are selling, but I, I think we're kind of at a stage of the market, and I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this, where a lot of folks don't want to really catch the falling knife, and what's the right number, even at a write down to the existing debt, what's the right basis to be into this particular asset for? Um, so seeing a little bit of that as well. All right, so you got to just explain this. I love this term, the falling knife. I usually use the falling sword idea, but it's the same thing. What is that concept? What does that mean uh, to catch a falling knife? Yeah, so to go back to office once again, it, it, the office is almost in some of the, the, the CBD markets that we work in. It's almost, uh, and I'm stealing this from a retail broker, but it's more of a chicken or the egg. Um, office brokers are coming in this particular retail broker who's a, a fantastic retail broker and they're saying hey we need restaurants we need bars you know we need a starbucks in the lobby we need all these amenities and he's saying guys my clients are sophisticated you know the gentleman who owns einstein's owns 70 of them you know it's not some mom and pop operation they're not coming back until they see and his best guess is three years of consistently people coming back into the workplace mm. so if it takes Best case scenario, worst case scenario, three years to to consistently have folks back in the workplace. Um, that value is going to continue to come down, and so a lot of the, the sophisticated buyers and, and are standing on the sidelines as they wait to see kind of where not as it's very tough time the bottom of the market, mm -hmm. but watch to see how much further it does go down and how much more vacancy increases in a particular property. Yeah, there was one investor that I uh, spoke to when I was at uh, at the bank during the GFC, you know, who was actually quite prescient. Uh, and he talked about um, having seen many downturns. He said, yeah, the, the market keeps on coming down. And then there is this inflection point where it does just start to turn. That's when he likes to jump in and uh, and to buy assets. Do you think? So actually, let me dovetail that observation with another comment that you made here in the uh, BizNow article. Uh, you said, uh, we're not at the batter's box yet. That was May the 30th, <laughs> right? Where are we today? Uh, just a little over a month later. And where do you think we're headed? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to stick by that statement. 
for now, maybe we're in the first inning. Um, if you had to have to use sports analogies, um, I, I really think actually it's interesting that you asked that question over the last month, we've seen some movement, mm. um, with, uh, lenders requesting more proposals for potentially troubled situations. They did assets. They just want to get out ahead. Of. Um, from speaking with folks we currently work with and folks I worked with during the last cycle, uh, and you, you'll be able to relate to, to your time uh, in a SAG group, in a special assets group. Um, it's not going to be a tidal wave where I feel like last time as a receiver, we had so much work at once. Now, was, for all intents and purposes, there was a credit crunch. Um, so Lehman fail, you saw Bear Stearns fail. Uh, right. There's just a complete and absolute lack of uh, liquidity in the marketplace. There is a lack of liquidity right now, but I feel a lot of it is, is people who are trying to circle their problems. It's lenders are trying to circle the problems and see what they are and also take more of a cautious approach as opposed to totally being sidelined by bad assets, which is what we saw last time. Sidelined by? Uh, bad assets, bad loans. So they're, they're uh, being sidelined, assets, making right. new loans due to that. So I feel that this is going to be more of a kind of a, a, a drip, drip, drip effect um, where it'll be a much more slow rolling um uh what's the word i'm looking for much more so, slow rolling um capitulation than maybe it was last time where it was a lot of assets and loans at once it was like an earthquake last time wasn't it mitch yeah. it was different it just suddenly snapped i think after lehman brothers uh collapsed that was really when i remember one of i remember one of my friends saying we are on the edge of a precipice and now is the time now is not the time to take a large step forwards <laughs> to go into this thing so what do you guys do I, what i wanted to ask i suppose this i thought this was a clever question but you've kind of answered it anyway i'm going to ask it anyway having had nothing to do for the last few years as a receiver uh how are you seeing things changing at the moment what do you think the rollout is going to be in the coming months and and i'm going to ask you to actually project forwards a little bit especially uh with the um low maturities that we're seeing and and that kind of the impact that's likely to have yeah the low maturities are, are going to cause uh you know a lot of problems for a, a lot of lenders and borrowers um but once again it's going to be a little bit more of a slow roll uh these loans may have 18 months left they may have two two years left three years maybe six months, three months. I mean, those are the ones that we're kind of seeing today in that regard. Um, where do I think this plays out? I, I think I've been wrong. I think so many people have been wrong. Um, really when COVID hit, you know, the great black swan event, mm. everyone thought there'd be a flood of distressed assets into the marketplace. And um, due to some government intervention, that wasn't quite the case. That may be coming home to roost now mm. in, in that regard. I don't know that there's necessarily uh, the stomach within the federal government um, in, in either executive branch to, or excuse me, either branch to um, roll out more aid, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's going to play out somewhat slower. I do think by the end of the year, from speaking with some of the lenders we do work with, whether it's valuation work, disposition work, or receivership work for, uh, I was just with one a few weeks ago, um, and, and he said by the end of the year, and we're doing some valuation work for them right now on a couple of distressed assets, but by the end of the year, he expects to have a couple of different situations to talk about with us. And he thinks by the middle of next year, um, as a special assets officer, he's going to be quite busy. Yeah, when I went into the bank, the, uh, the, the department was called the special asset division. Uh, and I decided, no, I don't want to be in the SAD division. So we changed it immediately to special asset group. But now, so uh, so what kind of, let's move to this question I promised I'd ask. And that is, you talked about office a lot, but what other asset classes are you seeing the beginnings of, let's put it that way. And what do you anticipate seeing with asset classes uh, over the next 12 months? Yeah, so what's been interesting is you read a lot about uh, some of the retail distress, but we really haven't experienced any from any of the lending relationships we have contacting us in regards to in regards to receivership. On the other side of the fence, um, Pilco Real Estate also does lease restructuring, and, and a lot of that is where uh, there, there's a transition um, distress. You may use the term. Um, so 
they may be busier uh, than I am. But from a receivership perspective, I'm not seeing a lot of retail. The other asset class, which is really interesting to me that, that we're discussing um, and, and getting calls on is multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of across the board, whether it's C product that's going through a value add renovation, mm -hmm. um, where you know someone's gonna take it from a C to a B or a, a B product to an A by putting in renovation dollars, the lender, which the lender is gonna fund. Um, we're seeing some distress there. Uh, and then they're also seeing it in newly built multifamily where the existing debt, which may or may not be floating rate, is the borrower, even though the property is stabilized, with the current interest rates because of, of the floating rate debt that they have on it, they're now at 9.5% as opposed to, say, 4.5%, and they're unable to service the debt. And so the interesting dynamic there, we had a call about this this morning, is how long do those borrowers, if they're coming out of pocket, how long are they willing to, or how long can they sustain servicing the debt? And how long are their investors willing to tolerate capital calls um, for to just service the debt? That's interesting, isn't it? So are you seeing any qualitative difference uh, between the spend? I mean, multifamily is the, you know, the, what do you call it? The, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the asset class that everyone talks about being the most uh, recession resilient, but you, you picked up on that. So are you seeing a qualitative difference in the caliber of sponsors uh, uh, on some of these asset classes versus the uh, kinds of sponsors that you saw uh, during the GFC? And the reason I ask that is the advent of crowdfunding and online syndication and the newcomers to the market. Are you seeing anything substantively different this time than last? On the assets we're working on, uh, no, it's, they're sophisticated borrowers. That being said, yes, uh, from what I've been reading about, and maybe they haven't gone uh, to a receivership, but they're headed towards an REO or an REO, particularly in the multifamily world. I feel like everyone thought that was a golden goose and it was really easy to fundraise around that, particularly the crowd fundraising you referenced. Right. Um, and with that, if there's a that value add component to it and you're on a floating rate loan, uh, when rates spiked, you, you're going to find yourself in trouble. So I think you had a lot of sophisticated or less sophisticated borrowers that hadn't been through a cycle before and, and weren't prepared to prepare for a, a down cycle. And so what are the challenges that you see when you go in? One of the things you've talked about, like the hidden, you know, talk about distress. I always think about distressed real estate as not being the real estate. It's the capital stack that's actually under stress. Uh, and that's what causes it, to, it causes it to collapse. But distressed real estate is distressed for all kinds of reasons. What, what kinds of things do you see? When you go into an asset, let's say with a less experienced sponsor, uh, that uh, surprises you or that is different from a seasoned sponsor. Yeah, and I'm going to refer back a little bit because I haven't seen a, a good deal of this work yet at this point in the cycle. But during the last recession, uh, we did a lot of retail receiverships and property management on retail centers. So they may be a 40,000 square foot shadow anchor retail center next to Walmart. Walmart's not part of the collateral for the loan. Um, you had a less sophisticated borrower that um, the deferred maintenance hadn't been taken care of at the property. So a lot of our mandate, and, and this applies to multifamily as well, because we worked on a number of these, was to go in and fix immediately any life safety issues. So trip fall hazards. Um, we had a portfolio of multifamily properties across uh, the western half of the U.S. and the southeast that were C properties at best. And I remember visiting one in Las Vegas and a handful in Dallas, um, this is 12 plus years ago, where you had decks that were literally ready to crack, uh, collapse. Um, and you'd have people sitting below these decks uh, right off of individual units. Uh, so our mandate there was, and these were less sophisticated borrowers that own this product, was to get in and fix those life safety issues as quickly as possible. Yeah, get those taken care of. So now, how do you balance then the, uh, so well, life safety is a different issue altogether, right? That's something you've just, you've got, it does liability, all kinds of issues involved with that. But how do you balance the question of investing more in a property to make it a better asset or just sell it at a discount, get out, out from under it? 
as a receiver? Yeah, so it's almost, and I'm not trying to put off your question, it's almost a better question for an investor um, or a lender. I think it's very complicated now, mm -hmm. uh, particularly where, you know, we've seen a little bit of off, um, uptick in office occupancy um, through the major markets, the LA, Chicago, San Francisco, the world, a tiny bit, maybe not so much San Francisco, but New York, DC, um, a tiny, tiny bit over the last month, but it's probably going to go back down again, it looks like from the data I've seen. Um, so, you know, do you hold the asset? If you take the asset back and you're a lender and, and, and put money in, it, it probably depends upon whether or not there's another viable use for that building, whether it's a multifamily conversion, um, or converting more of the, the ground floor into some sort of grocery or whatever it may be that, that would make sense. But uh, yeah, that's a tough question. I don't know if I have a great answer. Uh, no, no, no problem. I, you know, it's a tough, I, for anybody, it's a tough question. You know, banks, they don't want to own properties. That's not the business that they're in. So presumably if it's looking too challenging, just getting it off the books, even if it's at a discount is advantageous. Um, what kind of timescales, Mitch, do you talk about with a, with a receivership? And again, I'm keying off this article here, so I know what you've said already, but. <laughs> we'll see what I say now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, we worked on receiverships anywhere uh, during the last recession that lasted as short as six months, uh, where it's a relatively quick foreclosure process. Um, it, and two, uh, we had one that went three and a half, maybe even out to four years where there were some construction defects. So it was a high-end condominium project uh, al along with a high-end retail development uh, and their construction defects within the uh, condominium. About 50% of the condominium has been sold when we were involved. Right. Uh, so the lenders were both, the point of that is the lenders were both hesitant to take title because they didn't want to be in the chain of title for to be sued for construction defects. Right. Um, and so we were in that for quite a while, but it required a lot of repairs. And then eventually the note was sold and it was sold at a private uh, equity firm out of uh, the East Coast that, that was willing to take on that risk and take title. So describe to me the difference between a good and a bad borrower. What are the like? What what do you see? And let's let's talk about that a little bit. What what is what are the differences? You know, it's, it's probably uh, not to oversimplify it, but a, a lot like a lot of things in life. Good communication. Um, we've had not this current cycle. Uh, fortunately, what we're working on now, we have the borrower's been very cooperative and very communicative. Mm -hmm. um, but during the last cycle, I don't know borrowers that were very challenging to get them to communicate with you or turn over necessary documents or bank accounts as stipulated per the court order. Um, and really just from my time of talking to the special assets folks within the lenders that I worked for last time, that's about the worst thing a borrower can do um, is to stop communicating because then it kind of lights a fire under those special asset officers to resolve this issue as quickly as possible and maybe set to a certain degree costs to the side to get to that resolution. Interesting. Which usually means expensive attorneys. Yeah. And the other thing is as well, you know, it's it's a whole different thing dealing with a bank than it is with a private lender, somebody that buys the note. Uh, just to describe how, how that is different, right? So a borrower might not, might be happier dealing with a bank than a private borrower a private lender. Why is that? What is the difference? You know, tr traditionally, and I see 99% of the, the, the banks out there, whether it's community, regional, or national banks, they're relationship lenders, and they value their borrowers' relationships with them. The last thing they want to do is lose uh, a, a good relationship to uh, another lender, another competitor. Um, not all, but some of the folks in the private space, they're looking for their yield requirements. Um, and whether they get that through a loan payoff, um, that they purchase the loan at a discount, and then they can get that through a loan payoff through the borrow, or they're not necessarily always hesitant to take the property back and sell it um, to get there. So there's, I guess, in that scenario, as opposed to a bank with the private lenders, you, you, you may see some elbows thrown more so than you would with a relationship lender like a, a bank. Yeah, exactly right. So this was the, this was the different... So, so this this is the different kind of leverage 
uh, to get compliance from a, a non-performing, a borrow on a non-performing loan that's different between a bank and a private uh, a private lender. So what are what are the kinds of leverage that a bank can bring to motivate a borrower to be more cooperative? You know, not working for a bank during either cycle, um, a lot of what, what I've been hearing about from some of my friends in the banking world is if a number of the, if these loans were non-recourse, so no personal guarantee to a particular person or a group of people, uh, what they do have is something called bad boy carve outs. Right. Uh, and so if there's a fraud, um, anything along those lines that would trigger those bad boy carve outs, then the lender can go after um, the, the, the borrowers personally. And so those borrowers may think that they have a non-recourse guarantee, but if they trigger those bad boy carve outs through some sort of bad faith, that lender may or may not, but they will definitely use it as negotiation right. to come to some sort of resolution with their borrower by using the the, the, the threat of the bad boy carve outs turning into personal guarantees. Right. Whereas a private lender, somebody who buys a loan is going to be much more inclined to lean into that kind of uh, leverage, presumably. A absolutely, and I, I think the majority of the private lenders, uh, I shouldn't use the term majority, but a good deal of the private lenders in the high yield space will attach personal guarantees uh, um, to those loans. So they'll be recourse loans. Sorry about that. I, I am WFHing. <laughs> and I'm also flying solo with my two sons. Uh, they're on vacation this week, so they're kind of off on their own doing God knows what. Yeah. Oh, I've got you. We can hear dogs bark and I have a four year old uh, that's actually off at school, quote unquote, oh, school right now. So, Perfect. so what, but you never know if the dogs are going to bark. We get to do it. <laughs> I know. What can I tell you? Um, so, what are the more challenging uh, aspects of dealing with uh, distressed properties? Uh, and, and how much may be coming, do you think? I think there's a, a good deal more that's going to come. Uh, as we discussed earlier, we're very early in this this process. Right. You know, I use the term batter's box in the article that you read that we're still in the batter's box. Mm. Um, so I, I think there's a good deal more to come, particularly with office. It's on every, I mean, you know, my parents who know very little about commercial real estate know that office is troubled in major markets. Um, so there's a good deal more to come. What's the most challenging aspect of dealing with it? You know, assuming you have borrower cooperation um, and you take that out of the equation uh, and you have a strong property management partner and a strong leasing team, um, it may or it may not be. And I haven't run into this situation yet, but whether or not the, the, the if the borrower doesn't, the property can't sustain tenant improvements and leasing commissions and the borrower is not in a position to fund those, the lender will have to. And it's whether or not the lender wants to. I would say most lenders do want to see the properties leased up and stabilized. But I did uh, work for a smaller regional bank during last recession where their, their um, REO person, because we st would stay on after the foreclosure, he didn't want to do any leasing because he didn't know what the makeup of the tenants, um, a particular buyer would want, and he didn't necessarily want to spend the money either. Um, one of the things that you talked about was this run on talent, uh, the, the idea that there are seasoned experts in receivership. Uh, who have uh, you know gr grown even older than you and I, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so what are the, what are their uh, what, what's that uh, how, how's that going to be an issue? Do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, relatively recent kind of came to the conclusion that seventy five percent of the people I worked with during the last recession um, have either retired or they went into say uh, performing asset management within lenders. Um, so they do have that experience, so they can get older. Um, but there's going to be a, a lot of new people that are going to be groomed into special asset roles and whether they come from an origination perspective, but that's going to take time. Um, they haven't seen a cycle. I, I feel really fortunate. A number of the people we work with have seen cycles. Um, so as they say, it'll take a little while to get our muscle memory back as we work through it. <laughs> right. But um, they, they've seen a cycle. They've worked out troubled assets, troubled loans. Um, but there is. And, and, uh, I, I remember when COVID hit, uh, I had a friend at a large national bank that was on the under, underwriting side, and they were pulling the special assets group while they were scrubbing their entire portfolio, thinking the world was going to end. They were pulling in his underwriters for 25% of their time, for 50% of their time on a weekly basis to help them 
scrub their portfolio, value assets, know where the trouble could be. Um, and, and so it's it's going to be outside hiring and also pulling from within. Yeah, people that have experience. Yeah, when I, uh, I remember this during the GFC, there was also a dearth. Of, the last downturn was uh, early 90s, basically a 16, 17 year cycle. So people that have been through it, that's the only way you can have experience is to go through it. You, you can't, there's no books that you can read. You got to go through it and kind of figure it out, you know, on the fly. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's work I enjoy. It's problem solving, uh, which is what I like to do. And it's what you did in your, when you were at your private, the private invest, large private investment firm in the regional bank that you work for. Um, and so it's, it, it's, it's problem solving. Um, and it's with distressed assets. And so it's, you know, it takes like uh, like uh, the gentleman we're doing some, a uh, lender that we're, we're assisting or, or doing some work for as a receiver, like he said to me, it's like muscle memory. It's going to take a little bit to come back. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I do find that I, I keep hearing terms that I haven't heard for a long time. And I think, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that. That's right. Like all the stuff that swirls around bankruptcies as well and how those things play out. So what is the difference between a receiver and a special servicer? Yeah, good question. Uh, and I find myself, particularly when we take over a property, having to explain what a receiver does uh, quite often. And it's people that have been in the business forever, nor should they know if they've always worked with performing assets. I mean, right. How, how would you know? Um, it's a very unique specialty. Uh, so a special servicer is essentially, um, they service the CMBS loans. and a loan will go to a special servicer when there's maybe an eminent maturity default or some sort of default within the loan documents has taken place. And so those special servicers, it's securitized debt, so there's bond holders. And so those special servicers um, are now essentially in charge of working out that loan and bringing some sort of resolution. Uh, during, in between this last recession and, and the cycle that we're in now, a lot of times those loans would be resolved and they go back to the master servicer which is who services the loan when it's performing. But you really need a specialist to service a distressed loan. Um, and that's where the CMBS special servicers come into play. But their daily activity is very similar to a receiver, isn't it? Essentially, is managing the asset. Or is it more negotiation with the with the borrower? Like, what, how is it different? Yeah, more negotiation with the borrower. Um, the receiver's not involved in those negotiations, nor should they be, because there are fiduciary responsibilities to the property. I see. Um, and so the special servicers uh, negotiate with the borrower, and it's almost it's an asset management role to the, for the most part, similar to the receivers and asset manager as well. Um, but they're more of an asset manager of that loan. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's start wrapping up. Good grief! Is it already twelve? Let's go so fast. These things they always. I got me on a leasing call. Don't don't publish that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to publish everything. Do you really want me to take that off? I don't know if I can uh right so but um so people who are interested in buying non-performing assets distressed assets well what's the best route for them to do that should they uh all uh you know be calling you and saying uh, hey mitch what have you got or what, what are the what are the pathways for buyers of uh non-performing assets either either notes or distressed assets directly yeah, so um, with the distressed assets, uh, you probably would want to try and either contact a broker that has a listing or find an REO asset manager within a lending institution. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done, um, because these folks receive a ton of phone calls from all everyone circling around trying to buy distressed assets. Right. Um, you can also, uh, it, it's not a terrible idea, and I'm more than happy to field those phone calls, is, is reach out to a receiver occasionally and see what they may have um, that they're working on that they would need to dispose of. More often than not, as a receiver, you wanna market the pro property widely to obtain as much um, uh, monetization as you can for uh, that particular asset. It's interesting you say that. You know, what we discovered uh, at the bank was that when, what we found buyers of distressed assets thought the psychology was that if an asset is being marketed by a broker, it's going to be overpriced. There's like an auction event and it kind of goes up. But if it's being marketed by the bank, what do they know right, about marketing it? So we actually found that um, exit 
values was significantly higher when we did it directly than when we did it through a broker because the feedback that we were getting from investors was now nah, it's been over marketed you know what we we don't want to participate in that even though we did those auctions internally yeah that's very interesting uh that hadn't really occurred to me but they also i guess if I was going to look at it from a buyer's perspective, you should probably be very well aware that someone such as yourself or some of these folks that have been through cycles are very savvy, uh, distressed asset managers, and, and they know that trick of the trade. But that's that's the first I've heard of that. Yeah, we definitely saw that. And there were those that really did uh, twig to that when I was in there. It's like, there's, we, we, there's no way we're ever going to buy from you. <laughs> but they became yeah. really good. I was going to say good, 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 good psychology. Um, probably on your end when you're working for a lender because then the buyer would think that they have an inside track directly to you and therefore they're getting a, a deal as opposed to having a middleman yeah i shouldn't i shouldn't let on i mean this is a public forum ultimately i'm going to be publishing this to the world but uh i did used to send the i do used to like sending out emails that uh, gave the impression that the re recipient was the only person i was talking to but uh, in fact there were thousands of uh, emails <laughs> that went out doing the same thing all right. Well, look, uh, Mitch, it's a real, a real pleasure meeting you. Thanks so much for taking my, your time uh, to spend with me. So let me ask you one final question. What resources do you use to keep tabs on the market that uh, that mortals can use as well? Not proprietary databases, but what, what, where do you, where do you, what, what do you look at to feel what's going on in the market? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably like a lot of people um, in this space. Uh, I, I read a lot of publications, periodicals. Um, so in, industry magazines, uh, I believe not giving them a plug, I have no affiliation with them, but I think you saw my article in BizNow or what, my interview in BizNow. Um, commercial Mortgage Alert, Real Estate Alert is, is also Commercial Real Estate Alert is also a wonderful production. And then really, I mean, I've, when I travel somewhat, fair amount actually, and I have on my phone the Wall Street Journal app. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll download a bunch of articles prior, you know, for takeoff and whatnot. Too. And the Wall Street Journal, while it's somewhat high level, you, you you get some good intelligence as to maybe what's transpiring in certain markets. Yeah, and you also see they also tend to uh, lean into uh, real experts as well, so you get some really good insights. That's why I called you when I saw the article in Biz Now. Uh, Mitch Vanneman, Vice President, correct, at uh, Hilco Real Estate and uh, Receiver. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Adam, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, that was Mitch Vanneman, Vice President at Hilco Real Estate, talking about what it is to be a receiver, what's involved, what are the challenges, and where we are in the market. He is, I expect, will be uh, one of the busiest people in the industry over the coming months, even if he isn't super busy today yet. Uh, but uh, let, uh, do stay in touch. Uh, find out more about him uh, by going to the podcast page at gowercrowd.com. Of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of this show, go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter. It's totally free. And we cover the world of uh, real estate capital formation, raising money for sponsors and also providing educational resources for passive investors so they can capitalize on the opportunities that inevitably are going to be headed our way over the next few months. That's it. Mitch, thanks so much for joining me. It was a real pleasure meeting you. I especially enjoyed our little chat afterwards. So let's, yes, let's definitely stay in touch. And thank you too, dear viewer for, or I should say, hopefully viewers, plural, uh, for joining us today on the show Really appreciate you spending the time with us. And that's it for this time. I'll see you next time on the show. For now, though, this is Adam Gower signing off.